thank you for the invitation to join you in Southeast Europe, even if it is only virtually. I'm sorry I cannot be with you in person. There are few passages of the New Testament more central to showing the relationship between the gospel and the church than Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. I shall begin by reading those verses, and then I hope you will be able to follow what I say in your own Bibles. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. To the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. When we use the word church, what comes to mind? Well, in many parts of the world, not least in many parts of Europe, church, the word, refers to either a denomination or a big building with an old steeple. Um, but in the New Testament, the word church means something like the assembly of God's people or if I had to fill it out a little more, something like the people called by God, chosen by him, and transformed for the praise of his own name. Something like that. Now, we'll unpack this ourselves by working through chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, and observing, first of all, that this is one long prayer of thanksgiving. It's broken into two unequal parts. Verse 3 is a summary. Verses 4 to 14 breaks it down into four details. So, begin with verse 3, the summary, and we'll see how the text is going to argue. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So it's a it's the opening line of a prayer of thanksgiving. But this blessing for which the apostle thanks God is for what has been given to us. He has blessed us. And as we'll see working our way through the text, the us refers to Christians. He's not saying that God has not given any blessings to pagans or to unbelievers. In some sense, he has given them food and health and breath and life and his own providential watch care. But he has given us every spiritual blessing. And the us turns out to be Christians, Jews and Gentiles alike, people from every part of the world. We'll come back to that at the end of the section. So he's talking about Christians. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. Now, this is the first part of a praise to God, the Holy Trinity, to the praise be to God the Father and to his Son, Jesus Christ. And then before you get to the end of the section, there's reference to the Spirit. Likewise, in the next chapter, I keep asking 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in chapter 1, verse 17. So this is a distinctively Christian voice of thanksgiving, a Trinitarian form of worship. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for the gift of the Spirit that will be mentioned uh, in just a few minutes. Now, he has given us these blessings in the heavenly realms. That's a peculiar expression. It's found only five times in the New Testament, all of them in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. What does Paul mean by it? He has blessed us in the heavenly realms in Christ. So we're in the heavenly realms and we're in Christ. In fact, the expression in Christ or, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> or in him or the like is used 11 times in these verses. That is, all of the blessings that come to us come to us because they're secured for us in Christ. The first of these is found in this verse itself, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. The blessings with which Paul is concerned are not those that are disassociated from Christ, but they're peculiarly Christian blessings. They're ones that are secured to us in Christ, by Christ, and for Christ's praise. But still, what does it mean to say he has blessed us in the heavenly realms? Well, as I've said, that expression shows up um, five times in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and it is worth looking at each of the five. The first is here. He has blessed us in Christ in the heavenly realms. The second shows up in verse 20, but begin halfway through verse 19, 119. Paul has been talking about the incomparably great power that God has exerted for us in Christ. And then he says, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. In other words, the power that God exercises in the lives of Christians is the same order of power that God exercised in raising Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Well, in that context, the heavenly realms is pretty obvious. Christ was raised by his heavenly father, not only from the dead, but he was raised to the heavenly realms. There is not only his resurrection, but his ascension. The heavenly realms is thus the very presence of God. He, elsewhere we learn he is seated at the right hand of the Father of the majesty on high. So Christ is seated in the heavenly realms. Then in chapter 2, verse 6, a little harder to understand. And we're told God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Now that's a little harder to understand because it doesn't feel as if we've been raised to the right hand of Christ personally or in our bodies. God raised Christ from the dead and, and now we're being told we've been raised too? And in one sense, we, we haven't been. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 makes it very clear that we're waiting for Christ to come back and, and then the dead in Christ will rise. So what does Paul mean by saying that we too have been raised with Christ and seated with him at, at the right hand of God in the heavenly realms. Well, hold on, come to the next verse first, chapter three, verse 10. God's intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. That is to say, God's plan of salvation takes place in the transformation of people who constitute the church, but that God did this in part to make known his name and his purposes and his glory, not only amongst us here on earth, but amongst the rulers and the powers, the heavenly beings, the angelic powers in the heavenly realms, in the abode beyond this earthly natural sphere. Is this for just good angels? this announcement, or is it also for evil angels, demons? Well, we press on to chapter 6, verse 12. In chapter 6, verse 12, in a passage that all Christians know, we're told, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 
In other words, there is a struggle going on not only here on the earth, but an even bigger struggle, a cosmic struggle that takes in the realms that God inhabits, but that, that we normally speaking do not yet inhabit. But this good news of the gospel is declared, proclaimed not only to us, but to those who inhabit all of these heavenly realms, both good angels and the demonic world. So what does it mean then to say that we have been raised with Christ in the heavenly realms? Well, at the risk of tumbling into theological jargon, let me give you a phrase to sum it all up. The phrase is a little obscure until we unpack it. But let me give you the phrase, then we'll unpack it together. In the heavenly realms, I take it, is a way of giving a spatial equivalent of inaugurated eschatology. That's the phrase, a spatial equivalent of inaugurated eschatology. Now let me explain. Start at the back end. Eschatology is the study of last things. So it's the study of the new heaven and the new earth and of hell. It's, it's a study of what happens when Christ comes back. Uh, uh, Christians embrace a wonderful eschatology of anticipation of what God will finally bring to completion in Christ Jesus at the end of, <clears throat> at the, end of the age. That's eschatology. But Christians are used to thinking of inaugurated eschatology. That is, there are some things that belong to the end of the age that are inaugurated now already anyway. I mean, when we think of uh, God standing as the final judge, well, in one sense, the picture of that in our mind is of God standing as our final judge at the end of the age. But there is a sense in which those who are justified in Christ now have seen God as their judge and the one who declares them just and acquits them of their sin now already. Justification is a final act of God, but, but it takes place now. By faith in Christ Jesus, we're, we're declared just already because of what Christ has done to bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Justification is a, an example of inaugurated eschatology. Or... There is a sense in which, of course, we, we do not have our resurrection existence in all of its glory until the end of the age when we gain our resurrection bodies, but already we have the Holy Spirit as the down payment of the promised inheritance. We will see that that crumbs up again in verse 14. The Holy Spirit who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, so he's the down payment, the, the deposit, the guarantee of what is yet to come. So Christians are used to speaking of living between the already and the not yet, between what has already been secured by Christ because of his death and resurrection and what is not yet given to us, not till the very end of the age when we will receive resurrection bodies and death and decay and sorrow will be no more. So Christians around the world are used to talking about inaugurated eschatology. This expression that Paul uses here we're with Christ in the heavenly realms, is a spatial equivalent of inaugurated eschatology. So in the spatial sphere, what we're looking forward to is getting to the new heaven and the new earth. But in one sense, we're already tied to that. We already belong there. Let, let me give another illustration. In Galatians 2.20, in texts that all of us have learned by heart, uh, we're told, I am crucified with Christ. Well, in one sense, of course, you weren't crucified with Christ. He was crucified instead of you, instead of me, in my place. But because he died in my place and bore my sin and took my death, therefore there is a sense in which I have died in Christ. I am associated with him. Not only so, but I rise with Christ Christ bearing my sins rises and is declared vindicated before God because of what he has done. He has paid the price of death by dying himself. And I am hidden in Christ, so I am viewed as rising in Christ as well. I, 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 I am to view myself in those terms. Paul not infrequently talks in those terms. For example, in Colossians 3, 
Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Well, again, raised in one sense, raised in our identity with Christ, raised because uh, if Christ's life is pulsating in us, it's, it's his resurrection raised life that is already ours, even though we have not yet finally been raised. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Or again, verse 3, for you died. That is when Christ died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There's the futurist dimension of of eschatology, of waiting for Christ to come back. Now, all of this is summary. Chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So what are these spiritual blessings with which we have been blessed? Well, you can summarize them briefly by simply reading the following verses. They include such things as election to holiness, adoption as the sons of God, redemption, forgiveness, being enabled to understand God's wonderful plans, what he calls God's high mystery, the gift of the Holy Spirit who is the hope of glory. These are the kind of spiritual blessings for which Paul offers thanks to God. And what I want us to see is that these things define the church and tell us what we should be most grateful for in life in our various situations today. So let's run through these four together. Number one, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because, number one, we have been chosen and adopted. Verses four to six, praise be to God for, verse four, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Now, some people, when they hear of election and predestination, immediately get very nervous. But at one level, it's not too hard to come to grips with. Uh, Consider God's relationship with Abraham. How did Abraham become the covenantal father, the, the ultimate patriarch? Was it because he woke up one day and said, God, this is a terrible world, lots of sin, but I've got a suggestion to make. Why don't we start over again? You be my God, I'll be the grandfather of all your people. We'll have a whole new race, let's call them Israelites, Hebrews, and you'll be peculiarly their God and They will be there. They will be your people and and will show the world how to really do this properly. Is that what happened? No, he was amongst his pagan ancestors when God chose him out of Ur of the Chaldees. He was a wandering Aramean, one of the prophets says. And yet God chose him to become the father of the patriarchs and the one who pointed ultimately to Christ, according to Galatians 3. Well, what about Moses? Did Moses volunteer? Well, there is a sense in which he did. As a young man, he thought that he would rescue his people, and that got him into a murder charge and fleeing for his life until he was 80 years old. He wasn't ready until God chose him. Or what about David? Did David volunteer? No, no, no. He was the runt of the litter. He was the caboose at the end of the line. And, uh, and it, it was God's choice of David that made him what he was. So in other words, in all of these great turning points in redemptive history, God takes the initiative and chooses his own people. So why should we be surprised if God takes the initiative when he saves us? That's what's going on here. And that is something not to be ashamed of, but to be thankful for. For this reason, we give thanks. He chose us in him before the creation of the world. Before the creation of the world shows that it wasn't our doing. 
It was God's doing even before we existed. He chose us in him before the creation of the world, not simply to be privileged, but to be holy and blameless. Genuine election works out in transformed living because God's election of his people is to life and transformation and holiness and blamelessness. We should be moving in that direction until the consummation of all things when we received our glorified bodies and we shall sin no more. Now, another way of looking at this is adoption to sonship. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. Now, in the West where I live, adoption is normally associated with infants, with babies, with very young children who are orphaned or abandoned in some way and a family comes along and adopts them. They become part of their family. But in the first century, it was not uncommon for an adult to be adopted. It may be, for example, that a a couple had no children but had a very good servant and they decided to make the servant their son. The son would take on the family name, the family responsibilities, show honor to the family parents and eventually take over the family estate and so on. So sonship was bound up with identity, with, with who you really are, with who you really were. So if God has adopted us to sonship, if in God's love he predestined us to sonship, it's so that we would act a certain way, so that we would act godishly, so that we would act like God, so that we would be, to use words that Paul has already used here, blameless and holy. We are to be children of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and pattern ourselves to be like God in all ways in which God's image bearers can be like God without ever pretending to be God. And God has given all of this to us, the richest imaginable gift that you can possibly be imagined. What are all the riches of this world compared with this? To be loved from before the foundation of the world, to be chosen when we couldn't choose ourselves, chosen to be holy and blameless, to become sons of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because we have been chosen and adopted. And even this, Paul instantly wants us to remember, is to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, verse 6. In other words, he's not done this because he owed it to us or because we merited it or because we somehow earned it. Rather, this is from the freedom of God's sovereign grace poured out upon us. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because we have been chosen and adopted. Number two. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because we have been redeemed and forgiven. Verses 7 and 8. In Him, that's still in Christ, I said in Him or in Christ comes up 11 times in these verses. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Now, in English, at least, the word redemption is a word used in God talk. It's not a word that is used on the streets of our cities. I don't know what equivalent word is in Croatian or in Albanian. You'll have to decide that for yourself. But there was a time in English when the word redemption was used in ordinary parlance. If you went to a pawn shop, you could... Um, pawn your watch to get some money. And if then you managed to get some money back, you could redeem your watch. You could buy it back by paying the price of the watch plus a little bit of extra for the pawn shop owner. So that redemption was used in the context of uh, pawn shops, which were at one time very common in the West. Or 
Sometimes redemption language is used in terms of mortgage payments. You're trying to buy a small flat somewhere and, um, and when you finally made the last payment, you've redeemed the mortgage. Now the house is actually yours. Well, in the first century, redemption language was often used in connection with slavery. Um, in America, the slavery that we shamefully engaged upon was achieved in the first instance by buying slaves, capturing them on the coast of West Africa and transporting them across the Atlantic. But in the ancient world, in the Roman Empire, slaves could be captured. They were sometimes the result of a, a military defeat. You were defeated as a military unit and you may well then lend your life in slavery. But many slaves became slaves in the ancient world because of bankruptcy laws. There was no protection if you lost everything. You borrow some money from a rich cousin and um, then you, uh, you, you've done this to make your business grow. And then sadly, the economy takes a bad turn and you lose everything and you still owe the money to your brother-in-law. You have no means to uh, repay him. And, and so you've got no choice but to sell yourself into slavery, perhaps you and your whole family. Now, the only way you're going to get out is if somebody buys you back, redeems you, so that redemption was often tied up with liberation. You, somebody pays some money to redeem you. And in fact, the exodus in the Old Testament is often described as liberation. In that case, liberation from slavery to Egypt. God redeemed his people. He came and took action, paid whatever was necessary to pay, exerted his power to redeem his people from slavery in Egypt. And that becomes a model then for the way God redeems his people from their sin today. God gave his son to redeem us. Christ gave up his life to redeem us. He paid a price. He paid the price of his own death, bearing our sin in his own body on the cross, as Peter puts it. He has redeemed us. He has liberated us from sin. And that's why the two expressions are parked side by side. We're told, verse 7, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. Through his blood means through his death. Christ shed his blood. In the New Testament, everything that the blood of Christ is said to do is sometimes said to be done equally by his death or by his cross. It means by the atoning substitutionary death of Christ. He shed his blood and we have been redeemed, freed. Such freedom is not freedom to do anything we want because that inevitably leads to sin and sin is a form of slavery. It's freedom to be what we ought to be. It's freedom to be released from the shackles that tie us down in shame and degradation. It's, it's freedom to be holy, freedom to love God with heart and soul and mind and strength, freedom to love our neighbors as ourselves, and freedom from guilt, freedom from condemnation, freedom from hell. There can't be any greater freedom than this. And in Christ, we have been redeemed. That is, we have received the forgiveness of sins. And let it be said, this in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. In other words, in the first place we saw, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because we have been chosen and adopted. Now praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because we have been liberated, we have been redeemed and received the forgiveness of sins. And all this as a fruit of God's grace is not deserved. It's not something that we've twisted God's arm for. He's lavished this on us because he is the kind of God who is rich in mercy, as we read elsewhere. Well, in the third place, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because we have been shown God's high mystery verses 9 and 10. 
With all wisdom and understanding, God made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. One of the most striking things about the New Testament gospel of Jesus Christ is that this gospel is said on the one hand to be predicted in the past and fulfilled in Christ. So we're told again and again and again that certain things were done in order to fulfill that which was spoken by the word of the prophet Isaiah saying, whatever. Where is Jesus to be born? Matthew chapter 2. Well, Herod asks the Pharisees and the Pharisees look up Micah chapter 5 and they, they said he's going to be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, for thus it is written. In other words, it's predicted that the Redeemer will come from Bethlehem, from David's line. So the gospel is seen as that which has been predicted and is now fulfilled. But the gospel is also sometimes seen as that which has been hidden, but is now revealed. And then it's easy to stop and scratch your head and say, wait a minute, how can the same gospel be said to be revealed, but now fulfilled, brought to pass, and hidden, but now revealed, now disclosed? Entire systems of theology have been hammered out over the tension that is between those two uh, poles. But I would like to point out that Paul doesn't think of them as attention at all. Look at the last three verses of Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 to 27. Here's the Apostle Paul. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel. So he's talking about the gospel. In accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, that's what the gospel for Paul is. It's the message that is proclaimed by the apostles about Jesus Christ. In keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past. So here's the gospel that is seen to be hidden for long ages past, but now revealed. And this message that Paul preaches is in line with what has been revealed about this message long hidden. The message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but, verse 26, now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings. Paul means made known through the scripture. So it's there after all. It's really truly there. Through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. In other words, for Paul, the gospel can be seen as that which has been hidden and now revealed, and yet it can be seen as that which has been predicted, prophesied, and yet fulfilled. How can that be? Well, when you stop to think about it, it's the way it really was. There are many, many components of the gospel that were prophesied in the Old Testament, but often in slightly obscure ways for perfectly good reasons. Consider, for example, the apostles during the days of Jesus' earthly ministry. You remember the great scene in Matthew chapter 16 in Caesarea Philippi when Jesus asks his followers, who do people say that I am? And some say this and some say that. What do you say? Jesus asks them. And Peter speaks up and says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus says, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, Peter gave the right answer. And he's blessed by Jesus for giving the right answer. What he said was true. Yet at the same time, the context shows we have to acknowledge that Peter didn't have all of the right answer. Because when you and I today confess that Jesus is the Messiah, we cannot help but include in any understanding of his Messiahship the fact that he was crucified, that he died, that he rose again. But Peter didn't understand that. 
Because when Jesus goes on to talk about how he, the Messiah, must be crucified and betrayed and beaten and he must die and he will rise again in three days, Peter rebukes Jesus, be this far from you, Lord. Messiahs don't die, Messiahs win, especially someone like you that can do all these miracles. Uh, don't, don't speak to me of dying, uh, speak to me of triumph, the glory of, 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 of the Messiah, which earns him the immortal rebuke, get behind me, Satan, you don't understand the things of God. So here was Peter confessing truly that Jesus is the promised Messiah in line with predicted scripture, yet still finding that part of the message about what this Messiah would do was opaque. It was hidden to his eyes. And not only Peter, but all the 12 apostles faced that blindness. After all, when Jesus is actually buried and in the tomb, what are the 12 apostles doing? Well, one of them goes and commits suicide for his betrayal, Judas Iscariot, but the rest are hidden away in an upstairs room. And what are they doing? Are they singing praises saying, yes, I can hardly wait till Sunday. Boy, is he going to surprise them. He, he, he's, they're not thinking in those terms at all. They're terrified. They, they, they simply have no category for a crucified and resurrected Messiah. Blind, it's, it's opaque. And yet there are these Old Testament passages that speak of what will come and overturn things in three days. There, there is... There is the, the wonderful servant song of Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Now, all of that is predicted, but the fact of the matter is most of uh, early Jewish believers before Jesus rose from the dead did not have a category for, for, for a crucified, resurrected Messiah. In other words, it was predicted. It was there in the text, but they were still blind to it. But now what has happened, this side of the resurrection, this side of the giving of the Spirit at Pentecost, this side of the proclamation of the gospel, what has happened now is God has made known to us the mystery of his will. Mystery meaning not that which is mysterious, not that which is secretive, but that which is hidden. The, 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 the hidden parts of God's will, the hidden parts of God's, of God's redemptive purposes, these have been made known to us, the children of the gospel, according to God's good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. fulfillment. You know, every once in a while, you, you run across Christians who, who say, you know, it's all right to be a Christian, but it would have been much, much nicer to be a Christian in Moses' day and see all those plagues. It would have been much nicer to be a Christian in Abraham's day and watch miraculous developments take place and God's self-disclosure with the two men, angel beings who'd come and talk to him. And, but that's not the way the New Testament sees things at all. The most privileged believers, we're told, are those who live this side of the cross. Those who live under the new covenant those who see how the bits and pieces of the Old Testament fit together, those who are not finding so many things hidden, more and more is prophesied and revealed rather than hidden and only now disclosed. There is more that is coming to be disclosed at the end of the age, but we have so much better a grasp of how the whole Bible fits together than they had in the Old Testament before they had the New Covenant Scriptures. That is an, an, an unimaginably great blessing. God could have saved us without telling us very much. But one of the things for which the apostle thanks God is for the blessing of revelation. So, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, not only because we've been redeemed and forgiven, but also because we have had this glorious gospel disclosed to us and our eyes can see. And finally, 
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because we have been claimed as God's portion. We have been claimed as God's portion. The verb usually translated chosen in our Bibles, in him we were also chosen, is not the verb that is used for God's choice earlier on in the chapter. It's a word that means something like chosen by lot. And the language here more tightly means something like we have been chosen as God's portion. So, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because we have been chosen as God's portion. The Old Testament background to this shows up in a number of passages, not least the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. There we're told, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is allotted inheritance. So here we're told, we, the church, are God's portion, God's inheritance. We have been chosen by lot. We've been chosen not only to be blameless and holy in the first part of the prayer, we've been chosen now to be God's portion. We are God's peculiar people. What a spectacular privilege that is. And in the following verses, 11 and 12 are in the first person plural. This is what we received. Paul means we Jews, since all the first Christians were initially Jews. And then verses 13 and 14, he changes from we to you, and he's addressing the Gentiles in the churches that are reading this epistle. So the we part, in him we were also chosen. We, we who have been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Picking up all of these film, these, 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 these threads, these, these strands, and all of this is for the praise of the glory of God in Christ Jesus. That is what comes to us, to we who were the first to believe. And then we're told, and you, verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal and so on. So now Gentiles are in view. Now the people that are in view are from Croatia. They're from Bosnia. They're from Herzegovina. They're from Moldova. They're from Albania. They're from North Macedonia. They're from Slovenia. And even some outside Southeast Europe, like the odd Canadian, like me. In other words, here is a vision of the church made up not only of those who are God's inheritance, but God's inheritance made up of people drawn from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. When you say Jews and Gentiles, that embraces everybody. It reminds us of the vision of Revelation 5 and 7, where people are drawn together from every part of the universe every part of the world, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And this salvation is so spectacular that God's people are sealed by him, by his Spirit. When you believed, verse 13b, I think that is correctly translated, not after you believed, but when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Today, some people have a bank account with a long list of numbers and letters that constitute the password to it. And it's easy to forget those long lists of numbers and names. And, and your signature is supposed to uh, ratify that a check is to be cashed and so on. But in the ancient world, they often used a little seal some of the seals were like little rolls with bumps of design, letters, figures on them, so that if you ran it over an ink pad and then over a piece of papyrus sheet, you left a distinctive mark. That was your seal. It, it was peculiar to you. Or because the, the, the little moles stuck out, you could run it through a, 
a piece of soft clay and leave the mark embedded in the clay. So it's as if God has poured out his spirit on certain people, drawn from every language, tongue, and people and nation, and said, I stamp you with my seal. This one is mine. And this one is mine. And this one is mine. Did you see all of God's redeemed people, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether born in Southeast Europe or born in South America? It makes no difference. If they're God's, redeemed by Christ, God has said, in effect, this one is mine. And he has secured that truth by the stamp of his own seal, the Holy Spirit, who is the blessed inheritance, the down payment of what is yet to come. And all of this to the praise of his glory. In other words, the church of Jesus Christ is his redeemed community, chosen and transformed by him, with sins forgiven, loved with an everlasting love, already adopted as sons of God, already enjoying the Holy Spirit that is not only a mark of God's ownership, but also a mark of God's, own, of God's power to transform until the last day when the inheritance will be completely and utterly and totally ours in experience. Meanwhile, we have been seated with Christ in the heavenlies and enjoy his presence, his power, his comfort, his ownership to the praise of God's glorious grace. Amen. <laughs>